is not for gardens, G is for God. Everybody knows that. But in ABC of Montreal, G, as far as we are concerned, is also for gardeners. You cannot have a garden without a good garden. If you want to have things grow, you need someone to plant, weed and water, look after. And it is in this greater context of urban settings we are trying to really cultivate gardeners. Why do we want to cultivate gardeners? It's a complex story. Cities, the way I see, where the majority of us live now, face a major problem. We have not challenged ourselves or our cities or our professionals, designers, planners, architects, urban designers, managers of cities, to get more and expect more from our cities. So, the engagement is to try to see what cities can do. Cities deliver and produce a lot of things. Cities create wealth, create knowledge, universities are there, culture, CCA is there, a lot of humanity is there. But what we really want to get into is ask cities, why should they be heat targets? Why cities should be producing more heat and not cool the planet? Can they do that? Why can't cities be asked to produce more energy than they can use? That's possible. Then the mindset that we create about places and buildings and communities that we build would perhaps transform our thinking about cities rather than conventionally continuing to work only in one manner. And cities have done that. Cities have stood up this taste of time. They have become very successful. They create everything. They make widgets, they make culture, they make buildings. They... So certainly we can raise the bar and say, can cities be cooled down? Can cities, which consume all the food, can they produce some food? It's a question, uh, a kind of crazy question to ask in a hemiboreal climate of Montreal. But let me go. According to Clément de Mer, Director General of Cartier International de Montréal, Montreal has its river, its mountain, the changes in elevation. It is the city's raison d'etre, its DNA. An island tilted towards the morning sun, a succession of plateaus descending from the mountain to the river. Until, recent, until a century ago, much of the pleasant day Montreal was dotted with apple orchards and melon patches. Roads like Côte Saint-Antoine, Côte Saint-Luc, Côte Saint-Catherine, Côte des Neiges, Côte Virtue, all connected these great farms. Over the last century, our city has changed. Cartier International, when it was transformed, Clément and others had another vision how that part of the city will be transformed. Heritage Montreal was partnering that. CCA was partnering it. All the major stakeholders around Cartier International were partners in transforming that particular place. So the question is not going back to the farms, but the question is changing the character of the city so that it starts cooling itself 
it renews itself and heals its wounds. But however ambitious and beautiful these landscapes may be, blue collar workers cannot and will not be able to cool our cities. Taxpayers will not be paying for more blue collar workers to turn our cities around. We pay enough taxes. So the only way we can address this challenge is to cultivate more gardeners. Citizens have to become gardeners. How do you empower citizens in taking their city in their own hands and increasing gardening? How do we create more and more green thumbs in Montreal? This is what is the kind of philosophical mooring around which this project happens. There are a couple of community groups working in urban greening, some for Ulan alternative. And no coincidence, but this is a coincidence. There was no show the project of the conservatoire. It was on that roof that they had their garden in some containers. They lost it. They came to McGill. They said, we have a government grant. We want to have a rooftop garden. Could you give us a roof? McGill says, maybe we could. They talked to people. They knew that I was doing urban agriculture around the globe. I said, no, we do not want another rooftop garden. If you want urban greening, it has to be where people are. We cannot have it locked up somewhere where people cannot access, safety, security, and other things are issues. We have to bring it down where majority of us are, they can participate in this process and build this exercise. So it is within this situation. Clement Amar's project was $90 million to turn around the Cartier International. This project which we started didn't have $90. So it's a big difference. We had some buckets and we started our garden. <laughs> so the talk is about one project, Edible Campus, but it is also about how modestly and in very innovative ways we can, as a kind of group, as a community, start taking control of our cities, a block at a time, a neighborhood at a time, institutional compounds at a time, and then take back our city in another manner. So certainly this is the area where you see it's the <laughs> edible campus as we call it, on a corner. It's about a particular garden, but the way we imagine and the way we have tried to build it is to create it in such a way that people can see it, people can participate in it, and slowly but surely, if they want to do it on their balcony, if they want to do it on their rooftop, if they don't want to do it in those places because they are not easily accessible, they want to do it in their laneways, in mineralized surfaces, in lands which are available, how can they become much more active? Not only gardeners, managers, and really uh, forgers of cities' future. So this is a product which can really teach people about what is your dream house. I ask people whenever I talk. Majority would tell me that it's a house with a garden. Half the city of Montreal lives in a situation where we have duplexes and now explosion of condominiums. They do not have access to gardening spaces. How do you live with this, this sort of situation? But we have a lot of mineralized surfaces, we have a lot of other opportunities. Can we make this into kind of growing opportunities? That is the challenge we are trying to deal with. So the question is not just making a garden, 
but also showing people how do you create opportunities <coughs> in different locations. Our cities certainly have rooftops. And Rina, who has been working with me on design and the presentations, uh, which Fabrizio um, mentioned, uh, will go a little more in detail about how we have gone about conceptualizing these gardens and why and where these opportunities lie. But the question is also creating opportunities not for just growing, creating opportunities to bring people together, different age groups, communities in which there are children, there are grown up, there are young people, there are mobility impaired, forgotten people. That's what makes city, city, diversity. And unless we can include all these people within this network, it's not going to work. So everyone counts in making of this city. Everyone has to be, all hands have to be on the board. Otherwise, we're not going to turn around this dirigible that's going off in the wrong direction. So it is also not just a physical vision, a social vision around which we're trying to build a garden. People from all walks of life, people those who have forgotten, people those who are elderly, people who are homebound, they're very much part and parcel of this garden. How it happens, Pierre Rassa is going to talk about a little bit after I step down. Pierre Rassa works as an um, uh, urban agriculture coordinator for Sanapur Rula, who are partners in this garden of ours. After we finish, we are also going to show, if you people are interested, hands on. If you want to be a gardener, how could you become a gardener? So there are some buckets and classics and so on. So this is what is the game we will have. And if you have questions, we certainly are here to answer them. How it is a social partnership? As Fabrizio mentioned, Minimum Cost Housing Group that I direct at McGill is a research group. And it works in the field of housing works in very poor parts of the world, in barrios in Mexico, have worked in barrios in Argentina, have worked in slums in Sri Lanka, in Uganda and other places, where we have realized challenge, the daily challenge that poor people face of poverty, hunger, and so on. This is where they certainly have greater use for urban agriculture. But mind you, food security is also an issue in very wealthy city like or province like Quebec. One in six people in Quebec are food insecure. We do not see it amongst them. But people whom we saw in wheelchairs, they may be sitting at home. They can't go out. In this winter, what happens to them? How are they fed? Access is not easy. There are other kinds of people, immigrants who come to the city, who are just starting to get used to it, the types of food that they like to eat and so on. Where does it grow? Where can they get it at a fair price? Again, this is what our city is made up of. A lot of diverse groups of people. They also have to be addressed. So having learned these things internationally, at home also at the Miguel and Montreal, I have seen issues related to this. Alternative, there was another group that was working in urban greening, which continues to work in urban greening. And Santa Porula is a uh, community organization that uses food as a vehicle to break social barriers. Alternative in Santa Porula had this rooftop garden, which Saya's office attacked. <laughs> Just joking. But the building went into the transformation and change. They become orphans when they came. We say, we are going to do a garden really where well public is. We will have some theft. So I say, it's okay. You sharing food, you share food with some other people. Are you willing? 
we'll put posters. We'll tell them that your food in the harvest which we'll be growing here goes to Meals in Wheels on Wheels program, which is targeted for mobility impaired. Pop. Chances are people will respect. It has advanced amazingly well. It's going to be a model so people can see it. Then people can take the lessons and bring it home. So in the downtown core where the edible campus is located, building rooftops take up more than 50% of our land area. So rooftop gardens are definitely a good idea. They have large exposure to sun and they have a large amount of land mass, especially in um, dense areas. But the minimum cost housing group was already thinking about this in the, in the early 70s. And this is an early publication that we had created, um, Rooftop Wastelands. And in that, rooftop gardening was already being explored, but what we challenge now is to think beyond the rooftop at the other 50% that creates our downtown core. And so there's plenty of space that becomes accessible for us to grow in if you think differently about it. And so these spaces are available to all of us. There's all sorts of unused spaces, such as vacant lots and laneways, vertical surfaces that we have private access to, but they're still part of our streetscape, such as um, railings and balconies of our private homes. And there's also paved areas of concrete plazas that we see everywhere in Montreal. And all of these spaces can be transformed. On the McGill campus in particular, these spaces were plentiful. There were rock beds, vertical surfaces of concrete brutalist building facades, and paved areas uh, that are concrete plazas with no vegetation on them at all. The plaza that the Edible Campus is sited on is 300 square meters of hard concrete space that surrounds the Burnside building. 3,000. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. 3,200, actually. <laughs> um, and this, this space actually was used as just a three-way, so it was a very underutilized space. The space was transformed into not only productive gardens, but it created a place for staff members, students, or anybody passing by to really stop and enjoy rather than just pass through. This is a demonstration that the city can become a center for food production and can help build healthy living spaces that are enjoyable in the urban context. In comparison to community and private gardens, this establishes a new typology of gardens that are open for people to freely roam through rather than gating our gardens to keep them safe so nobody steals our vegetables. And we face pretty much no vandalism in the seven years that it's been operated on the campus. And so this really demonstrates that this is a shared civic responsibility and a sense of pride that the community around the, the garden really shares, where everyone takes part either actively or passively to really care for the gardens where some, some students get attracted to the garden and sign up to volunteer, and they actively help maintain the garden, whereas others much more passively stop in the space and admire it or use it as a space that they choose to be around and enjoy. But it's that active role of not stealing that juicy eggplant or pepper that's beside you that really shows that you, know, you do care for the space and you do respect it. And so this is a site plan to show where the garden is located. And so the edible campus today is 256 square meters of raised bed gardens and 250 square meters of open garden space that is created with 3, 300 containers. <laughs> and so this actually had only started off with a very simple 137 container garden. In this section of the Burnside Plaza, and it's since expanded, and we even have two rooftop beehives now. So the container garden 
is a modular system that's expandable and easy to locate anywhere, especially to create the best growing conditions for your plants. It's created with a simple, affordable technology that creates a semi-hydroponic planter system, which Pierre and Saul will demonstrate <laughs> later. So basically this generates a, a space at the bottom of the container that excess water is, uh, is poured into so that there's less maintenance required in order to water the garden, especially in hot days where the rainfall may not be so um, so plentiful, and so plants always have access to this um, to this reservoir of water. And the garden is maintained uh, twice a week, where five volunteers come in for two hours. Also, at the end of the system, the containers at the end of the season, the container system is packed away and stored for the winter, and then brought back out for the next growing season. The edible campus later expanded to include raised bed gardens. There are berry patches and two main raised bed gardens that are on the campus. One is a vegetable patch. And the benefit of having this, this raised bed garden for vegetables rather than container gardening is, um, is that longer root vegetables can be planted there, so it's more it works better for the, the needs of these plants. And also for the herb garden, which is the second garden that we have, um, it allows for plants that are perennial to recreate every year without having to replant them. And these raised bed gardens are highly productive. The vegetable garden goes through four to five crop rotations in one season, which is quite dramatic considering the limited year, months that we have to grow in a year. And so our most e recent expansion are two beehives on campus. Honeybees play a vital role in food production as pollinators that help the fertilization of our plants. Bees help to, po to pollinate over 90% of our world's crop. And the current declining bee population greatly affects our food production. So this will be the third year that we have the Urban Beekeeping Collective on the campus. And last year, actually, there was quite a lot of honey produced, which wasn't the main reason for the bees being on campus, but the honey, as well as the majority of the, well, all of the harvest that comes from the edible campus goes towards um, the programs that Central Cole Long um, has in action, so Pierre Vincent will be introducing those. Donc, euh, je vais faire la partie sur la centropole en français. <rire> Donc, on est un organisme bilingue. Euh, si vous avez des questions, ça peut, je peux répondre en anglais aussi. Um, donc par rapport au centre Paul Roulant, comme le mentionnait Vikram au début, c'est bien beau avoir un jardin, mais ça prend des jardiniers, ça prend aussi des, des personnes qui bénéficient euh, du jardin. Donc le centre Paul Roulant, on est un organisme communautaire situé sur le plateau Mont-Royal, ça fait 18 ans, donc cette année on fête euh, notre majorité. Donc on a 18 ans cette année, euh, on a commencé très petit comme une pop roulante. Et puis en fait, c'est le fun de raconter un peu l'histoire de comment le Centre Paul Roulant a commencé parce que c'est vraiment ces valeurs-là qui ont continué avec les années d'être euh, transmises, si on veut. Donc c'est deux amis qui, euh, dans, en 1995, dans le temps du référendum, ils venaient pas du Québec. C'était un peu une situation économique particulière, ils ne trouvaient pas d'emploi, puis on décidé, ils faisaient du bénévolat pour une papote roulante. Puis ils étaient étonnés de voir qu'ils étaient les seuls jeunes qui s'impliquaient dans la papote roulante. Qui, puis il y avait une très bonne interaction avec les clients aussi. Puis euh, ils se rendaient compte que les clients bénéficiaient du service, mais qu'eux aussi, dans le fond, ils, ils bénéficiaient beaucoup de ce service-là. Et puis ils ont décidé de créer leur propre papote roulant, qui est le Centre Paul Roulant, depuis 18 ans. Et puis c'est vraiment ça qu'on essaie de faire au Centre Paul, c'est d'utiliser la nourriture comme une façon de connecter les gens, puis une façon de rapprocher les gens autour d'un thème que tout le monde est censé, donc la nourriture, puis qui bénéficie pas juste les clients, mais aussi toutes les personnes qui, qui viennent. Donc c'est vraiment un aspect intergénérationnel, interculturel, multiethnique qu'on essaie d'avoir à travers tous nos différents programmes. 
euh, puis de façon très organique, dans le fond, le Centre Paul euh, comme grandit au fil des années, puis euh, d'où est venu l'intérêt aussi de faire de l'agriculture. Donc, on avait euh, la papote roulante, donc on offrait des services de repas aux personnes euh, âgées ou aux personnes en mobilité réduite. Et puis, avec les années, bien, on s'est dit, bien, pourquoi pas produire nos propres légumes, propres légumes de bonne qualité aussi à ces personnes-là, qui, qui vont être bio, qui vont être locaux, euh, donc on, on est sûr de la provenance, et puis c'est un peu comme ça qu'on s'est lancé en agriculture urbaine, euh, puis qu'on a continué aussi avec euh, différents programmes. Donc la, la production euh, de, de légumes euh, va principalement pour trois, euh, trois programmes, donc euh, la papote roulante, comme on en a parlé, euh, le programme de, de panier frais, puis euh, les mini-marchés qu'on fait. Donc, euh, au fil des années, notre production a augmenté. Je pense que c'est bien mentionné aussi qu'on a maintenant trois sites de, de où on fait du jardinage. Donc, le campus à McGill, maintenant, depuis nos nouveaux buildings aussi sur centre paul roulant on fait de l'agriculture sur nos toits. Puis, depuis euh, l'année dernière, avec un projet de pilote, on fait euh, de l'agriculture périurbaine, donc à Seineville, sur une, une terre près de Seineville. Euh, puis, cette année, ce projet-là prend aussi beaucoup d'expansion. Donc, ça nous permet encore plus de répondre à une mission et de bonifier tout ce qui est euh, la bouffe qu'on peut produire, l'autosuffisance qu'on a là-dedans, puis pour les paniers frais, puis pour euh, les marchés aussi qu'on fait. Euh, voilà. donc pour prendre un exemple aussi, donc dans, on est un organe, à la base, comme je disais, on a commencé à faire l'agriculture pour la papote roulante, mais aussi pour démontrer, pour être un modèle de cycle alimentaire fermé. Donc, on produit des légumes qu'on va transformer, qu'on va utiliser, qu'on va livrer à des personnes euh, à mobilité réduite, en majorité des personnes euh, aimées. Puis, on va compléter le cycle en utilisant toutes les déchets organiques de la cuisine pour faire du compost qu'on va réutiliser ensuite dans nos jardins. Donc, on essaie d'être de, 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 de un exemple de, de cycle fermé, dans le fond, de cycle alimentaire fermé. Puis, le jardin, en fait, bien plus que d'être un jardin qui productif, c'est vraiment un lieu euh, qu'on essaie, puis je pense que les femmes l'ont bien exprimé aussi. C'est très intéressant que ce ne soit pas sur un coin, que ce soit un endroit accessible euh, où les gens peuvent, le genre de la communauté de McGill, mais de, peu importe qui part, dans le jardin peut s'arrêter, s'asseoir, bénéficier du jardin de, de l'île de fraîcheur qui est créé. Puis c'est aussi un endroit, une opportunité pour nous d'organiser des événements par rapport, euh, par exemple, ici c'est euh, le brochet des clients qu'on fait à chaque année dans le jardin à McGill. Puis il y a différentes opportunités. Euh, nous, on fonctionne principalement avec de l'implication bénévole, donc plein de bénévoles qui viennent à chaque journée euh, nous aider dans nos différentes tâches. Puis le jardin, c'est une opportunité aussi d'éducation, une opportunité d'engagement bénévole pour nous. Euh, donc ça, c'est un événement qu'on organise, c'est la fête des récoltes qu'on appelle le Iron Chef, qu'on organise à chaque euh, fin de saison, donc au début, vers la mi-septembre, début septembre. Euh, et où on invite euh, des restos de Montréal euh, qui veulent se prêter à l'exercice de cuisiner euh, un repas fait avec euh, des choses euh, récoltées dans, dans le jardin cette journée-là. Donc c'est comme un happening, c'est une façon de vraiment rendre le jardin public à la communauté, tisser des liens aussi entre différentes personnes, en ayant des restos qui sont là, en invitant toute notre communauté, à les bénévoles. Donc c'est une belle façon de célébrer un peu l'agriculture urbaine puis la production locale. Je pense que Bécran va faire une courte conclusion avant de, de, de se lancer dans les questions réponses. It's a modest little garden, one could say, which started seven years ago. No, six years, we're doing the seventh year. It's a, in kind of the crudest sense, it produces more than ton of harvest every year, goes to the soup kitchen, as Pierre Massat showed. And we meet in season more than 30% daily needs of the kitchen. The harvest comes in kind of a big gusher. 
when it comes. So it's very difficult for us to absorb it all. But now we have expanded our garden, as Pia Masa said. We have gone on to very urban areas, and Howard is sitting there. Um, he is the instigator of it. And uh, afterwards, you can speak with him, too. But there are other copycats which are born out of these activities. On the campus of McGill, there are several other gardens now. Students have started. Both the university and students' body <coughs> held up this garden as an example and say, can we do more sustainable things? This is a good example of something we could do. Students' initiative, uh, sustainability uh, projects fund, to which students are paying 50 cents to a credit on their own enforce the hand of the university to go to donors and raise, match that fund. So that fund now supports bicycle repair shops, other night shift kitchens, recycling of um, electronic waste, and, this. and these initiatives are supported through these kinds of activities. We run these events on the campus Growing season doesn't really match with the academic session, but September, October are overlap months during which these big events are held. It fuels our uh, volunteer force for Santa Porula. So there is a very logical university community link which kind of dynamically utilizes strengths of what one group has, but the other doesn't. McGill has space, McGill has design groups and talents, McGill has young people. Volunteer organizing is done by Santa Porula. They are very efficient in social work and outreach and reaching into the community. They need new blood. There is a partnership that form. Turning around of these spaces, McGill has limits uh, with budget cuts that we're facing. It is only this kind of volunteer gardening that can turn around these paved areas. Other universities, like Yukon, in the example that was shown in the previous um, presentation, one of the quadrants has been taken over by Yukon students, and they have converted their own garden. So there is another provocation taking, taking place in this whole process around. Since last two years, I have been working with uh, a school in Rhode Island. They want to start uh, gardens and their food systems within the university they want to take in their own hands. They have teamed up with a heritage farm and the town in which the heritage farm is set up has been brought back to life and they want to work with the Perry urban systems and the university food system. So the limits of this kind of ideas is being tested now. An ordinary idea, but at the end of the day, it's not mm, oldies like me who is going to uh, carry the ball. So we are very conscious of not just university age kids and others. Since day one, when we started our program, every summer we run Camp Cosmos. Young children come and participate in. Uh, gardening, they learn about gardening, where their food comes from, and they have their own corner where they have their gardening experiments going. They learn about, they participate, they do that. Parents come and volunteer one day of the week. This is not babysitting, it's fun. It's a remarkable kind of way of looking at this social dynamic in a very different way. When university campus will get populated or academic compound will get populated by wheelchair bound older crowds. This is what happens because of these actions. This is, I think, just the beginning. Only way it can happen is by everyone participating. Just like these kids, all of you are included in this process. Uh, if you are interested, if you have questions, certainly all three of us are here and Howard is here to answer them. 
But if you are interested in gardening, the container growing, if you have uh, any desire to do things, there is information. The students of architecture did a study of what ordinary gardeners are doing. So there is a green thumb book just surveying how different members of the Montreal community are doing their own gardening. That is also part of this exhibition here. And there is other information about Sandra Porula, which you can take home. And if you are interested in volunteering and so on, you are welcome to do gardening. Go deliver food, work in the kitchen, many things to do. And if you just want to learn about the bees, join the bee the cooperative that has grown up. Thank you very much for your patience. City is very interested in it. Montreal was a leader in this. And all these initiatives uh, have, um, uh, in my, um, the city's initial reactions were um, after um, Expo 67. Uh, the gardening initiatives date back to the turn of the century, uh, the 19th and 20th century, when um, uh, teaching about gardening, like what we're doing, was introduced in the schools. And then uh, during the Great War, the First War, urban gardens uh, were introduced. So that dates back. But the new initiatives of the city, the community gardens and so on, date back to post-67. Expo 67, economic uh, slowdown, um, first oil embargo in 68, second in, uh, oil embargo in 73, um, 74, 75, the major uh, fire in the city of Montreal, the red night when the uh, firemen went on strike, and then communities asking city to give us opportunities to grow. That's when these initiatives started happening. And then a lot of community gardens in the city grew up. At one point, Montreal had the most number of community gardens, but it still does, of any city in North America. But waiting lists are very long. We did studies of their publications and so on. So this is where I think other initiatives like collective gardens, working on shared properties and others started coming up, sharing of uh, opportunities and so on. Um, it's three years, four years now, how we had the Perry Urban Initiative, when uh, there are urban growers on the periphery uh, where students from agriculture came and asked, can we do stage there? And we asked city and all other municipalities to come and participate in Perry Urban. So they all are interested, but in my opinion, lethargy on the city part. And uh, wheels of the city move rather slowly. It is when citizens got together and they forced the hand of the city with the citizen signatures, when we had the group, the Travai the Agriculture Urban, um, come together. We first launched it at Sanskorula, Alternative and all come together. When we collected 29,000 signatures within three months, physical signatures, city for the first time was forced to have public hearings on urban agriculture. They still have played very conservative. Animals in the city, birds in the city, expanding of the kind of concept of what the gardens and so on are, will still have to be negotiated. But yes, city is very keen. There are other cities moving very quickly. Because they are bombed out cities like Detroit. They don't know anything else what they can do. So they think this is an aspirin and that's going to cure the city. It has its limit. So I didn't answer your question specifically.
growing public food on public land, I didn't understand. Uh, in a park, for example, so there could be uh, fruit trees rather than ornamental trees. Um, so that's one example. Another example would be um, like There is a tradition. In Europe, there is a big tradition. In France, for example. Mm -hmm. If you look around the whole of Ile de France, uh, there is that. But my argument would be that we have enough space in this city outside of the traditional. I don't want to turn this on. I don't want uh, to believe in lawns be gone argument. There are other opportunities in the city to create more green rather than take one green and replace it with another. You understand? This is, I part my way a little bit conceptually. Yes? Uh, I was just curious, uh, I mentioned the Green presentation that on the off seats for the uh, Bees were sort of not native here in North America, one could argue. Uh, we had other bugs pollinating. Um, but we did bring bees from Europe in big way. So certainly we have brought a new species uh, to this part of the world. And the species which were uh, uh, kind of more preferred were European, um, the Italian. <laughs> um, and they have to be protected in winter time. So mm, uh, you have to wrap them up and mm, keep them comfortable. Uh, hopefully, uh, at least the queen and the kind of majority of the uh, beehive survives for the cold winter. To some degree, would you say that they actually? Yeah, but uh, if it's very cold, the poor thing mm, does vanish. Uh, so, um, but uh, the, the whole nest gets stronger in that manner. So that's what it is. And now, uh, recently, mm, uh, we have brought Russian bees too. So they are, <laughs> <laughs> and there are two schools of thought. <laughs> but um, it's an interesting question, and there are mm, beehives. Mm, there are cooperatives. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, what about squirrels? Pardon? What about squirrels, rats, and birds? Uh, we um, uh, had a little bit of um, problem with squirrels. We had a little bit of uh, problems with uh, uh, because of the construction in on Sherbrooke Street, a real downtown area. Uh, we had an infestation of uh, rats uh, for uh, a year. Uh, we lose uh, a bit of crop. Uh, I don't know why squirrels like to eat eggplants. Uh, <laughs> they're not eggplants, they go and eat the plant itself too. Uh, but um, they don't like to eat chili. So the entire growing is um, organic. So we have used, you know, sprays of uh, uh, <laughs> different kind to deter them. We have had uh, marmots, mm, uh, but we trapped them and sent them back on the mountain. Lucky we haven't had raccoons come down yet. <laughs> The seedlings are already um, getting ready. So we begin the season on the grounds in April, but it starts in March. Uh, we try to 
extend the season at the end also. So uh, it ends in November rather than, so that is physically in these locations. We do have things going dormant in these locations. These plants with planters which you see here, we just now have uh, turned around uh, a segment, uh, so we have another batch which would become more permanent planters. So the intention is to try to get uh, some kind of vines and other structures growing along these places so they become uh, uh, structures which we do not have to replant and move every season. So the engagement is very much there. On the periurban, there is uh, growing in the ground with greenhouses, so that really extends the season considerably with minimum amount of energy. <coughs> so that is what is the intention. If you add energy and heat, then it's another story altogether. So the challenge is to try to do it mm, without mm, using too much uh, additional energy. But it's a very important challenge that we're facing here. And this, mm, mm, we try to do, like, uh, even in planting, we try to do uh, 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 planting of garlic in October so that they will stay dormant in the winter and they will be the first things which will start growing. So uh, how you extend the season and use the season Same thing could be done for cabbage, uh, for all the uh, hardy vegetables like kale and so on. Um, I was just wondering if you guys have any plans, uh, anything in particular that you plan on expanding in the future. Like I know in Montreal we've been talking about maybe getting chickens legalized in the city, like if that's where they might go, or just out of curiosity if there's anything in particular in the works. It's in your hands, no? <laughs> Why don't you join us? We can do that. That's what I would say. <laughs> Is that possible to have animals in the city? The, the, the public hearings we had has not permitted that. Yeah. But there are other cities in North America which permit that. Seattle permits it. New York permits it. Uh, even Canadian cities like Vancouver and Toronto are really seriously at the kind of acceptance phase, but it's in a very special way. Uh, only thing that we have accepted are honeybees up to a point. Uh, yeah. And what is the easiest plant to grow and the most difficult? <laughs> 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 Do you have any favor for some plants that you wanted to develop? Uh -huh. Well, I think it really depends on, on the context also. But yeah. Let's say in these type of containers, the self-watering containers, not everything grows. I mean, it, it works well for, let's say, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, you know, like fruit plants, but it's not going to be good for any root vegetables or anything because it's not deep enough anyways and it's, it's you know it depends on you kind of need to know uh, what you're growing in and, and, and the different types of plants and requirements you know so it really depends on the plant requirements the type of containers you have if it's a container or raised beds if you're you know you have access to some it depends on the environment also, you know, if you're in the shade, whatever, you know, like in, in this case particularly, we have some buildings sometimes that create shade, so we're not necessarily going to plant something that requires a lot of sun, so we're going to go for, you know, greens or other types of plants. And, but I would say if you were to start a garden at home and you have a, a container like that, so I recommend you plant, you know, like herbs, uh, a tomato plant, something like that. Would, the easiest and fastest are the fresh greens, which are the most expensive. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have a lot of uh, sunshine, it will give you a good crop. And because it gives you a crop very quickly, you can 
prepare a bed so you get your fresh greens and you will get within three weeks your harvest coming so you will start getting it's a good as you say what's easy and so there is a kind of gratification instant gratification sort of relatively fast and um, after three four crops you have to take it out otherwise it starts bitter so then again you can get something new other uh, easier thing to grow are like snow peas they come quickly and they you can get the peas to eat you can eat the fresh greens of the snow peas and so on so um, you have to be but if you want tomatoes and eggplants and other things you better find places where there is at least 6 hours of sunshine so that uh, you know you have to start learning these things but it's a fun thing to do yeah i have another question it's about the seeds because we were talking about cycle of, of the vegetable okay you plan to grow the vegetable you can eat it and after that all of the leftover can go back to the soil but what about the, the seeds do you also work on that like if i want to grow like uh, this kind of salad or, or even potatoes i need also to buy somewhere my the seeds or the bulb or something like that so are you also working on, on this aspect of the urban farming mm -hmm. agriculture or I mean, seed saving is a whole different story. It's yeah. it's really <laughs> uh, it's a different process, and you need to have you need to take into consideration many different aspects. You know, depending on, on the type of plants, you don't want to, you don't so you want to encourage cross pollination if you want to keep a certain cultivar, things like that. You know, different depending on the plant, and it requires a some land to do it also because it means that you're not gonna. I mean, some things like squashes and things like and so on, you could still eat and save the seeds, you know. But if you wanna, if you wanna save some seeds, then it it means that you're not gonna eat these vegetables, right? So you're there's gonna be a whole uh, section of your crop that's gonna be that's gonna go towards uh, seed saving. So I mean, we're not doing it because we're mainly focusing on you know harvesting and using the food. And we don't necessarily have enough space, anyways, in this particular garden uh, to do it. But there's some. But at the same time, there's some plants that are gonna. Uh, or, how do you say that? They're gonna be. Uh, they're gonna seed themselves year after year, anyways. You know, some flowers, something like calendula, some some things like that are, are gonna just reproduce themselves. Uh, so it de really depends on. on what your purpose is, but at the same time, like we buy most of our seeds, uh, but they're like they're really good uh, places around Montreal and that are certified organic, and they're you know they're, that's what they're doing. So it's kind of great that you know some people focus on seed saving. Par exemple, on va produire aussi de plus en plus de légumes racines, de légumes d'hiver, 
à cause de, de la fin périurbaine, puis on va produire à plus grande quantité. Donc, cette année, c'est vraiment un de nos objectifs aussi d'avoir plus de transformation pour utiliser tous ces produits-là euh, pendant l'hiver, puis pour aussi euh, en vendre, par exemple, dans les mini-marchés, puis pour ne pas avoir de pertes non plus, parce qu'il y a certaines choses que des fois on va avoir trop d'anticipé, qui ne peuvent pas nécessairement être utilisées à la cuisine ou dans les marchés, puis tout ça, puis dans le fond, tout après ça va être récupéré pour être transformé, pour, 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 pour réutiliser pendant l'hiver.